I'm here with Nick Green, and we've got some food problems when it comes down to food marketing, the food industry today. And I would consider you one of the experts in that field. In a couple of words, what would you say is wrong with the food industry today? Gosh, I could spend the next 20 minutes talking about just that question alone. Um, I think fundamentally it comes down to access. Um, and that's frankly the, the problem that we're trying to solve with Thrive Market. Um, you know, healthy food is uh, geographically inaccessible to many American families. About half of Americans don't live within driving distance of a health food retailer. Um, it's economically or financially inaccessible to a lot of people. Uh, average markup on organic is anywhere from 30 to can be 60 or 70 percent, uh, depending on the category. Um, and then probably one of the biggest ones, which I know you're passionate about solving, is just the overwhelm, the intimidation factor, all the kind of, in many cases, self-imposed barriers that people have, where you know there's conflicting information, there's contradictory information, uh, there's just an overwhelm of too many options, and where do I even start? Um, so you know, at Thrive Market, our mission is to make healthy living accessible to anybody, and we got to break down each of those barriers. Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job on geography, shipping anywhere in the country. Pretty good job on economic, by with our membership model, uh, selling at wholesale prices. But that, that third one is actually the hardest, which is you know, changing attitudes, changing habits, simplifying the process so that people can actually stick with something. Um, and then you know, staying consistent, because like, like, like you know well, there's a lot of contradictory information out there. Now I'm pretty stoked to announce too that for the last couple of years, I have been working with Thrive Market on creating my own product with them. And we decided a couple years back that a good nut butter would be the perfect product to team up on. So my nut butter has officially launched. So there's a couple of different ones. There's a macadamia nut, there's a cinnamon Brazil nut, which is sweet and tastes amazing, that's sweetened with allulose. And there's a chocolate hazelnut flavor, which is amazing. And they're going to abide by my rules too. There's a few different nuts in them, and then there's some allulose, and there's some salt. There's no fillers, there's no weird stuff. And the cool thing is if you get them through Thrive Market using that link down below, you'll save 30% off your entire grocery order, which also includes my nut butters. Plus you get a $60 free gift when you use that link. So you use that link down below and then you can find the nut butters there on the website and you can try whatever different flavor you want. I highly recommend you check them out. I created them in tandem with Thrive Market. So what you're getting is literally what I formulated and what I made. So definitely check them out. And if you're already a Thrive Market member, I'll put a link down below in the description that's specifically for a Thrive Market member that goes directly to that page as well. Yeah, I mean, if, if Someone walks into a grocery store and they're looking at all kinds of different products on the shelves. What do people need to understand about what happens at a supermarket? Like how does that, I don't think people have a clear understanding of how shelf space works and how it's not always what item is best for the person. It's more, there's almost, I don't want to say an agenda because that sounds bad, but there's, there's a direction in which things are steered to kind of get the consumer to buy certain things, even if they're not good for them. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a it's a rigged game, right? And this is the like I, I'm a capitalist, you are too, or or entrepreneurs. So uh, there's a lot of good that capitalism does, but one of the negative things is, uh, you know, whatever people demand, quote unquote, is what will be on the shelves. Um, and uh, demand can also be a self fulfilling prophecy. So if a business is able to feed demand, say, 20 years ago, to become a you know multinational conglomerate CPG. Uh, you know, assortment of brands, which were selling unhealthy things back then, um, over time, supply can influence the demand, right? And if those, uh, those brands, those businesses have huge marketing budgets, tons invested already in building the brand equity around unhealthy products, um, the funds and the government relations to, you know, lobby on behalf of calling their products healthy. I mean, there's so many ways that uh, once the uh, supermarket shelves are stacked with products that aren't healthy, that that can remain the case, even when you know, the medical, uh, uh, medical information, science tells us they're unhealthy, and people start to be more aware of that. Um, and I think, to your point, a lot of people go in assuming that you know, what's on shelf, well, look, it got cleared through the FDA, uh, cleared by the USDA, it's got to be safe, it's got to be at least somewhat healthy for me, and that's uh, definitely not the case. Um, a lot of these agencies set a very, very low bar. 
Um, and a lot of these brands have a lot of vested interest, these big brands, these brands that have been around for decades um, in kind of keeping things, uh, keeping things the same way. And the reality is uh, they use their war chest to erect barriers to smaller brands coming in. Um, and frankly, the, the retailers in many cases are complicit with that. So if, when you launch a new product, and I won't name specific retailers, but at major grocers or major uh, brick and mortar retailers and some online retailers too, you know, you're going to be participating in all sorts of pay to play games uh, where it can easily add up to ten, tens of thousands of dollars to launch a single SKU. If you want to have a relationship with some of the biggest retailers, you might be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get items on, uh, you know, on shelf in a single year. So that itself then rigs the game in favor of the general mills of the world versus some of your you know, smaller, more innovative brands that are trying to do something different. So it is, a, it is a challenging landscape. I think we approached it first from how do we really help the consumer um, and make it easy for the consumer, but we're also in a very real way serving those brands right, who didn't have an outlet to tell their stories to the consumer, to have a fair shake on the shelf. Um, who are having to go you know, toe to toe with brands that just had a lot more funds, a lot more brand equity, a lot more name recognition, um, but you know, in many cases, uh, really poor health profiles. You may not know exact numbers, but I mean, if we were to walk down, let's say the cookie aisle, the cracker aisle at a regular grocery store, what kind of margin do some of these like lower quality products, I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say no, no malice directly towards Nabisco or Oreo, but I'm just, you know, something like an Oreo, like, is there just this ridiculous margin? Because we hear this stuff and I don't know if it's propaganda out there that makes it sound like, like, okay, well, food margins are so slim and okay, we have to do this. We have to increase the price here. And I can't help but think that some of these like processed foods, like the margins aren't as slim as some of these guys are telling us, but maybe I'm wrong. No, I think, look, the, the center of the grocery store to begin with is going to have higher margins generally than your periphery. So fresh food is a low margin business. It's low margin because there's not a lot of brand recognition. So you got kind of commodification and therefore a lot of price, com uh, price competition. Uh, it's also low margin business just by the nature of the supply chains, right? And the fact that you have serious shrink uh, on shelf, which is a, a, a problem in its own right. Um, so in the packaged area, you have the opportunity to build brands. Once you build a brand, you've got more differentiation. You can charge a premium for that. So some of these well-known brands, again, I won't name, name names, but, but you, know, you and all the viewers can, can I'm sure, think of many. Um, they're able to charge a premium because there is no perfect substitute. You know, like I like Oreos. I'm, there is generic Oreos, but like if you know that, if you know the Oreo brand, you're going to go buy, you're going to go buy Oreos. So I, I think that there's that aspect which drives margin. Um, there's also the reality that uh, you know the processed foods, uh, because they're not constrained by um, health, because they're not constrained by sustainability considerations, um, because they are really only driving towards lower cost and better flavor and taste profile. Um, they're often using ingredients that cut corners, right? And they're using the cheapest possible ingredients. Uh, they're, uh, they're buying them as they scale at massive scale and, and, and bulk. Um, and so I think you do have a race at the bottom in that sense too, where they're able to take costs down. Some of that they take in margin, some of it they also give in price. I mean, one of the crazy things is if you go to you know, a corner store, say in a low income neighborhood, you know, the, the products that people are buying are the really unhealthy stuff. And that's because it's the cheap stuff, right? That's the stuff that you can really, like you can buy, if you just look at dollars per calorie, you know, Cheetos uh, are pretty cheap. Uh, probably the cheapest calorie you can get is soda, right? And uh, that's really, really sad where, you know, you have the scale effect on these business, on, 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 on those types of products combined with the brand recognition that they've been able to build combined with the, the race to the bottom on ingredient quality conspires to make these things well-known, uh, low price, and really unhealthy. Not to mention the icing on the cake of the hyper palatability that gets you addicted to the food as well. <laughs> well, so that's, I mean, that, 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 that goes without saying, right? Like, again, when you're not constrained, like, look, again, capitalism requires that you, you're gonna try to create products that people want. And if you're not constrained by, you know, uh, social or, or, or environmental concerns, if you're not constrained by health concerns, uh, it's very easy to create things that are just tailored towards giving people that like sort of uh, you know addictive sugar rush, literally, 
right? That um, that so many consumers today crave. And I think, you know, on the one hand, if you go back in time, you know, 30, 50, 70 years ago, some of that was more excusable because people didn't understand one how uh, truly uh, pernicious sugar is, uh, and so and trans fats and you know, all of these ingredients that you rail against uh, all all the time. You know, now people are. I would say beginning to understand, still not as widespread as it should be. But back then, like people maybe arguably didn't didn't know, and some of these companies didn't know. I think the challenge that's happened over the intervening period is, uh, you know, the evidence has mounted that these things are really bad for uh, for people. Evidence has also mounted, by the way, that a lot of the supply chains that are built that are you know bringing the prices on these commodities down uh, are really bad for the environment. Which is a whole other another whole other issue, but. If you now have a big business that's reliant on using, you know, high fructose corn syrup and all of these inputs and your supply chains are set and they're scaled out and your cost structure works and you've invested so much in building a brand around these particular set of products, uh, it is very, very hard for that business, for that, that, that uh, you know, corporation to shift their business model. And to their credit, I would say like from, you know, General Mills to... Uh, you know, Kraft Heinz, like some of these guys are through acquisition and in some cases organically trying to build a portfolio of better for you products. But, you know, they're never going to want to cannibalize their, their core business. Um, and they just can't do that. So it's, I don't think, to go back to your, your point before, I don't think there's some sort of conspiracy theory. I don't think there's like an evil Mr. Burns back there trying to poison people. Um, but, you know, through kind of the accidental progression of, of history and incentives and, uh, and kind of the way the system works, uh, you've got uh, a setup that doesn't serve people, doesn't serve the planet, um, and frankly, over time, will not serve these companies very well either. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You look at, uh, occasionally you come across a study that's you know, been funded by uh, you know, X company or a study that's been funded by you know, uh, cereal or, you know, it, it comes, and it's easy to look at that and say, this is purely conspiracy. And I hear what you're saying. And sometimes there's just so much bureaucratic red tape and so much stuff for them to try to change their existing model that it's literally cheaper and easier for them to fund a study yeah. that goes in their favor, that they can roll into a marketing campaign. Yeah. And that does sound malicious. It doesn't sound good. Uh, but it's not because they're necessarily trying to make everyone unhealthy in that particular case. They're saying, hey, wait a minute, this makes more dollars and cents for us to just actually launch a marketing campaign around this study than it does for us to change our entire die lines. Totally. And I think like he, we, we all have an incredible capacity for self-delusion, right? Like that you can, and with, with food especially, we can all convince ourselves like, oh, it's not so bad if I have this once in a while or, you know, maybe this isn't so unhealthy. And I think the same thing happens at some of these companies where like, you know, they, uh, you know, they should they should know better. But you know, if the incentive is strong enough, they're going to look for ways to, uh, you know, ways to, ways to support their case, and they're going to ignore the studies that don't support it. And if they find a researcher who's doing work that like seems very supportive of what they, what they are selling, uh, they're going to go and fund it. And you know, there's a unfortunately uh, long history of this kind of thing happening. Like if you look at the cigarette, the, the tobacco industry, right, of the exact same thing. And it wasn't, again, I don't think there was a conspiracy where the company is selling tobacco, well, maybe there was in this case, I don't, I don't know the full story, but you know, I would imagine that there were probably some researchers, there were some uh, doctors who thought smoking was just fine and had like, you know, were doing, the, doing bad science and, and, and thinking that, that it was good, probably not from a bad place. And then they got a lot of funding from the tobacco giants and you know, things kind of rolled. So I, tr I try to generally give you know, people and companies and things, the benefit of the doubt probably isn't deserved all the time. But I think that where we've gotten today is fully uh, compatible with there not being a conspiracy theory, but just being well-intended people following their incentives um, and building something that, you know, now has catastrophic impacts on, on human health and, and on the planet. And, you know, I, I mentioned before, you go back 50 or 60 years, like people didn't really realize how bad sugar was. That's because if you go back, you know, even if you go back a century, type two diabetes basically didn't exist, yeah. right? You go back fifty or sixty years, it was like this tiny little thing, right? And what you don't see is that there was it was growing exponentially to the point today, as you know, we have you know literally tens of millions of Americans that are diabetic, tens of millions more that are pre-diabetic. Um, like we have a true epidemic as a result of sugar. Um, so it's 
it's, it's impossible at this point to overstate how catastrophic the effect is on human health. Uh, when you look at diabetes, you look at heart disease, you look at, um, you look at even the links to cancer, um, and then probably most obviously when you look at obesity rates. I mean, let's talk for a second. People think sustainability and they automatically just think, okay, environment, only environment. They don't necessarily think about sustainability for, uh, for our consumption. They don't think about sustainability in that fashion. And sustainability has continually become a topic of conversation to support processed food and to support a lot of the unhealthy things, right? Well, it's sustainable, it's sustainable. And I'd be curious a couple of things. Like one, like, you know, what are you guys doing to help make sustainable healthy? And like, how can that coexist? And then the other thing is, you know, to your point on a lot of different things, whether it's malintent, you know, uh, or not being malintent and also sustainability. I can't remember his name. You might know his name, but the guy that created uh, the K-Cups. The, uh, you know, he's a great, he's a great example of someone that cre built something that ended up being gigantic and went back and said, it's one of the worst things I've ever done, hmm. you know, because of how it's, how it's ultimately turned out as far as just plastic cups yeah. everywhere, right? It's, I think that people don't realize how self-incentives can really just drive this process and that all it takes is a couple of people that are just like, once this machine is moving, it takes a lot to get it to stop. Yeah. So back you know, on the sustainability situation yeah. here, how is this, is this possible? Is it possible to have healthy food when we've got regenerative agriculture, we've got uh, you know, this, it, how, how can it be possible? Educate me on this, because this is not my wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, look, for Thrive Market, our mission is to make healthy, uh, we, we say healthy food, uh, or healthy products, accessible, affordable um, um, to anybody, uh, to every American family. Uh, and for us, there's two sides to the health coin, right? One is healthy for humans, the other is healthy for the planet. And I think what we have seen uh, time and time again is that those really are like two sides of the same, the same coin. And over the long run, if you wanna do things that are good for human health, it's gonna be also be doing things that are good for, for the planet uh, and vice versa. Yeah, so a great example is you know, organic food. The primary motivation for organic uh, historically has been, all right, let's not put pesticides into the soil, let's be better for the planet. Uh, but it turns out that when you treat uh, the soil with pesticides and when a uh, plant or an, a, an organism is treated with pesticides, like that ends up in the food. It makes a lot of sense. When it ends up in the food, it's not good for humans either. So pesticides, it turns out, are bad for soil, <laughs> they're bad for plants, and they're bad for humans. It's kind of common sense. Um, I think you can look similarly at like regenerative now, where you're going one step further, and you're actually having like truly better ecosystems that are regenerating topsoil, creating more health across every different animal and plant in that ecosystem. And it turns out that the foods that come out of those those ecosystems also are much higher in nutrient value. So not just missing the pesticides, but actively having more of the healthy, uh, you know, uh, phytonutrients, chemicals, et cetera, that you want for human health. Um, so, you know, we really do see human health and planetary health as two sides of the same coin. Um, and uh, and we, th we think a lot of people are taking that more holistic view of health. Um, and even if they don't see that relationship, they're starting to care more about the health of the planet, uh, which I think frankly, is a function of the fact that some of the issues around climate change are becoming much more difficult to ignore. Um, and so, you know, for us, like over, over time, like we launched in 2014, and back at that time, you know, we were doing carbon neutral shipping, and nobody was talking about that, no one was aware of it. We didn't even market it because it was just something we were doing on the back end that was the right thing, and we assumed that consumers didn't really care. Now, fast forward almost 10 years later, we have you know, almost as many people asking about the carbon neutral shipping program as we do about, um, yeah, about the fact that we're doing free shipping, for example. Um, as we've scaled, you know, we've looked to basically build sustainability into every part of the business. Uh, a big part of that's on the standards that we use for uh, food, which again, when we follow those standards, they tend to be healthier for people too. Uh, we've also used it though very heavily on like our own supply chains. Uh, on the way we package product, um, on you know the fulfillment centers that we run, for example, they're Leeds Gold certified, they're zero waste. Yeah, so you know, big picture, sustainability has been super important for us since day one. We see it go hand in hand with the, with the health of people too. Um, we've also seen that people care a lot more about sustainability and planetary health for their own sake, independent of the human health impact. 
Um, and I think that's one of the really exciting things going forward is that you know, more and more people want to vote with their dollars. Um, and they're thinking about health more holistically. So they're saying, hey, I want my family to be healthier. I want my body to be healthier. But I also you know, have a stake in making sure that our planet is protected and that the environment does better over time. Um, and being a member of Thrive Market is a way that I can proactively get behind a company that I know is going to pursue those values. Um, and I can, like, like I said, vote with the dollar um, to do good uh, for myself and, and, uh, and for the planet at the same time. Do you, I mean, do you really feel, I personally do, that voting with your dollars, whether it's through Thrive Market or even just going to a grocery store, I mean, that is the biggest driver for change. I mean, I, I really do feel like, yes, at the end of the day, like we are a capitalistic society and everything you see in a grocery store is usually, you know, capitalistic brand. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I even kind of... Uh, battle with my wife a little bit on this where she'll just be like, well, no, I still want to, well, no, you, like, don't support that. Like, if you don't feel that way, then don't support that. Like, well, it's not, my dollar's not going to make a difference. I'm like, well, if the message is out there and the message is clear enough, yeah. and, you know, what I like about what you're doing is that it is making those items and those things affordable because that is a very important piece. Because if you took, uh, you know, someone in a situation where, you know, they, <laughs> they're working two jobs, they're just trying to make it, and then you give them the option to get 300 calories for a dollar or get healthy food that's you know, 300 calories for $5, they don't really have a choice. And people don't always realize that from the peanut gallery, yeah. right? Like you look at that and you're like, just make that better decision. Like, well, easier said than done, right? Yeah. Like, and well, I don't think people understand how important it is to get the cost of these things down. Yeah, it, I, I mean, I totally agree with you and I think you know, a, a minute ago I was saying like, oh, one of the like dangers of capitalism, the negatives of capitalism is that you can have this, have this inertia. But one of the beauties of capitalism is that you can also have really massive change when consumer demand changes. And I think one of the most exciting things happening today, we call it the conscious consumer movement. Um, and it's not that a consumer is either conscious or they're not. I think it's that all consumers, like all people are becoming more and more conscious. And frankly, like, that is, I think, one of the, the upsides of social media. Uh, you know, you look at how uh, you know, someone goes on YouTube or they go on TikTok and they see a video that talks about an issue that's of social importance. Um, that can then inspire them to go learn more about that issue, go down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Uh, there's content creators out there like yourself who are creating content that raises issues a, a, around, or raises awareness around issues of health, uh, of sustainability. Um, and people are accessing those, and uh, they're getting as excited about those kinds of topics in many cases they are about the taste of a product or of like how fashionable some you know new uh, new clothing item is. And that's a really, really exciting moment. And I think, you know, as I said before, bigger brands are taking heed. There's smaller brands that are starting up that are saying, all right, we're going to go out and meet this demand. And then platforms like ours have been able to scale massively. You know, when we launched eight or nine years ago, no one really thought that middle class, middle America wanted to get healthy. I can't tell you the number of investors that we pitched who were like, how are you going to compete with Whole Foods? And we just had to explain to them, we're not competing with Whole Foods. You know, we're going after that, like, middle class, middle American, mostly moms who, to your point, can't afford to go into Whole Foods, don't have an Erewhon uh, down the street like you do here in, in Los Angeles, um, and who are really struggling to make ends meet on a month to month basis. And so our whole model with the membership is, all right, pay an annual membership, we'll pass on all the savings and the products to them, try to get the natural organic products at or below the price of conventional equivalents. Um, and you know, again, like I said, that's the beauty of capitalism. You can create that new model to meet the new demand of conscious consumers. Um, as an entrepreneur, for me, you know, like I grew up in middle class middle America, uh, outside of Minneapolis, you know, with a mom who was trying to get us healthy and break some generational cycles of, of, uh, of poor, poor nutrition and obesity and, and bad health overall. And, you know, I think I've heard, heard, heard your story too, and, you know, it's, it's come from a personal place. And so, you know, that, that to me is really, really exciting that we have an economic system that enables entrepreneurs who are motivated by their own, you know, conscious experiences. You've got consumers that are becoming more and more conscious, and you have dialogue that's happening between uh, content creators and brands and you know uh, sort of gen next gen retailers like us 
and the consumer to really change the dialogue and make change. And you know, I look at how we got to this place. It was basically a century, right, of, of bad, 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 bad decisions driven by, you know, how do we just increase productivity and yield and better taste profile and to hell with, uh, you know, sustainability and, uh, uh, and, and health for people. I think we're going to be able to reverse that much, much faster. And it's because of those dynamics. So it gets me super pumped. Yeah, I mean, we're moving at warp speed now compared to where we were before. It's like I always say that, you know, epidemiological data, observational studies, all this stuff is great. At the end of the day, you are still looking a little bit in the past, right? That's the only time you can see it because you're retrospectively looking at, okay, what has happened over the last 10 years? Oh, shoot, we have a problem. And for that to be actualized and then for change to occur, it takes time. And the fortunate thing is because of social media, as much of it is a pain in the ass a lot of times, it is also what allows this change to happen faster. Totally. So, you know, we're seeing it happening at warp speed yeah, now. Like 20 years ago, like some, you know, esoteric academic journal puts out a study, like that doesn't see the light of day for years, if ever, <laughs> right? Now, that same journal puts out a study, you pick it up, you read it, you digest it and translate it into plain English for your audience. And it can be seen by millions of people in a matter of weeks. You know, I look at, at our business and, you know, look, when we went out to fundraise, like no one believed that middle class, middle American people want to get healthy. Like when we said, oh, we're going to give away a free membership for every paid member on the site. We're going to go get low income families to actually get on site. People were like, they're not going to actually use the membership. Well, we, we went out, we proved that was wrong. And then there was not only millions, not tens of millions, we raised hundreds of millions of dollars where you know, that's pretty amazing that the venture capital market has been able to then, when we prove that we are right, give the backing and enable us to scale to do hundreds of millions of dollars of sales. So yeah, I think it's you know, the, what's happened with the tech industry, and there's a lot of hate on social media, there's a lot of hate on the tech industry, but there is the potential there to do tremendous good. And all it takes for that to happen going back to voting with your dollars, is for consumers to really be conscious, right? To care as much about these issues, their health, the health of their communities, the health of the planet, as they care about, you know, having the most fashionable, like, newest drop on sneakers or whatever it is that, that people also consume. Not to say that that's bad, but let's also balance it with some, some of these other considerations. You know, one of the most eye-opening moments for me with operating my channel was seeing how successful the performance was of essentially how, how to health shop, uh, how to shop healthy on a budget, like at Aldi and Costco and things like that. And there were videos I expected to do halfway decent, but I was just blown away by how much they just exploded in this. And what it really opened up for me was that, wow, like just that is like, it's not, people think automatically, okay, middle America or this mindset of inexpensive also just doesn't want to eat healthy. I don't want to spend money. No, you don't want to eat healthy. It really, there really is this huge gap there. There is a gap and of not being able to understand how to shop healthy for one, but also that it can be done, yeah. but also we need to push for that to get done. So it's very fascinating to kind of hear it from another side. Well, I remember when we launched, you know, the first day that we launched on Thrive Market and we started seeing the orders come in. And one of the most exciting things was seeing where were those orders coming from? not just geographically the state distribution, but even going down to zip codes, because you can go and see what's the average household income in a given zip code. Um, I'm sure you see something similar when you look at your audience and you know where, where are people? It is everyday American families, individuals that are wanting to get healthy, uh, that want to do things differently. And you know, again, you go back in time a couple of decades and like the only place where you could go to an organic store an organic grocery store might have been in a, in a place like LA or San Francisco or New York. Um, and you know, most people even that lived in those areas couldn't afford it, right? Like back 20 years ago, like if you wanted to work with the most elite trainer, nutritionist, like expert in uh, health and nutrition, like you had to pay whatever it was, probably hundreds of dollars an hour. And today you can access that individual, tens of millions of people can access that individual on YouTube. Uh, you know, in our case, we have 1.2 million members on Thrive Market. We put out hundreds of millions of orders uh, that are going all over the country to places that, you know, most of which are not within driving distance of a health food store. Oh, that's amazing, man. Well, obviously a link out to Thrive Market down below. You hear me talk about them on the channel all the time, but it was just nice to get a a little bit of a glimpse into how this all works because I don't think everyone has a solid understanding when they walk into the grocery store exactly what's happening behind the scenes. So Nick, I appreciate oh, it, my man. Super appreciate it.